Today, I'm going to talk about uh, chapters three and four because both are uh, quite short. Um, I tried to add some material from some of uh, Jenny Bryan's talks and the workshop that they did at our studio comp and things like that. Um, but it's a pretty straightforward set of concepts. Um, but yeah, we'll see how long we take and um, go from there. So, all right, chapter three is about practicing safe paths. Um, the learning, uh, I put a link to the workshop slides that are relevant to this at the start of our notes. Um, and our learning objectives are basically to learn how to use here, the package here, uh, to build safe paths relative to a project. And we'll get into a little bit the definition of a project here. Um, we're going to use FS path home to build relatively safe paths relative to a user's home directory. And I'll talk a little bit about why I say relatively there, but FS helps make it a little bit safer. And then how you can use system.file to build safe paths relative to an installed package. Um, I think only the here stuff is actually mentioned in the book, but I, I got the rest from the notes and they mentioned in the book that they want to add some of this other stuff. So I went ahead and sorted that out. So, all right. Um, first, we'll start with the, the here package. Um, that's a CRAN package here. Uh, and what it does is it finds the top of a project. So if, you, if you're if you using an RStudio project, the um, folder that has the .rproj file, that's the top. Um, if you're using something that you checked out from a Git repo, it looks for .git the directory.git in and whatever directory has that must be the top. Um, if you're writing in our package, it looks for the description file or that also works for things like book down. Um, so, and really it works for anything. You can just create a description file and it says, oh, okay, that, that must be the top. Um, and then finally you can make a file that's just called dot here. I didn't know about that one. Um, there's a packet or a, a function in here that I can't, remember off the top of my head, but it, it'll um, it'll tag it, or it'll create that um, uh, set here. So set underscore here will uh, create that file. And that's just a way if you want somewhere to be to count as the top. Now, you know, if you're following along in the book, the one <clears throat> that we should be doing at this point is create an RStudio project, but maybe you're working with something where that doesn't work and you can use the dot or use any of these other things to define that. And then the way here works is if you, it will create a pass relative to that. So no matter what your working directory is set to within that structure, it'll go up to the top and then go down. Um, something I learned on this, which it's one of those that I probably should have known, but never did, is that you can just, if you're if you type like images slash and tab, uh, RStudio pulls up autocomplete of all the files that are in that directory. I'm sure that is something that like everyone else knows, or maybe not, I don't know, but uh, that was nice to, to realize that I could do that. Um, or uh, something that's nice to do with here is you can do like build the path piecewise. So images is the directory. And then, you know, if there were some directory within images, I could put it there as its own word and it'll just string everything together with a slash in between. Um, so yeah, that's the basics of here. Uh, do you have any questions about that, Federica? Any comments? Okay. Go on to FS. So FS is another um, CRAN or another package that's available on CRAN. If you're using, um, I don't know, if you're using any of the tidyverse things that uh, deal with file paths, then you probably already have FS. If you have tidyverse installed, I'm pretty sure FS comes with that. Um, and it uh, has functions for handling paths. And I think the main reason it exists is this path home uh, thing that there is a base function path.expand that will take, it'll, its main purpose really is to take the tilde and figure out wh where that is, which is your home directory. But R thinks of your home directory as your documents folder on Windows. So it'd be, you know, your, you know, your username slash documents is your home directory is according to R most of the time on Windows. But on any other system, uh, the directory above that is counted as home in R. And so because of that, if you're trying to do relative paths, um, 
are de behaves differently on Windows versus on other systems. So FS uh, has this path dot or path underscore home that will give you the same direct same equivalent directory, uh, no matter whether you're on Windows or Linux or Mac. Um, and then there's this path function path home R within FS that does base it just does what uh, base path expand tilde does. It goes to that place, but you probably don't want that. Work with this, and that way, it's always that um, user directory. And if you want to go to the documents folder within that user directory, you'd say path home, and then documents would be the um, argument that you pass in there. Um, FS also has other useful functions for dealing with the file system. The um, one that I would call out is, uh, what is it? It's called dir underscore walk. Um, it will, it lets you uh, call some function for everything in a, a directory. So you say, I want to go to this directory and, um, you know, uh, bind rows, pull all of those files together into one thing or whatever. Um, maybe you want to rename everything. Maybe you want to um, get the properties of different or some certain property within there. So dir walk is really useful for that. Um, and then likewise, dir map, uh, dir underscore map uh, to load or to, so sorry, dir underscore map will like return the results of the function. And dir underscore walk just calls the function on each file. Um, both of that can be really useful. Um, but there are a bunch of other things within FS. So if you ever need to do any like heavy file manipulation stuff, that's a package to explore. And then the last piece of this chapter um, is this is system.file. It's a base function. Um, so the dots are whatever file you want to get the path to, and then pack give it an argument, a package with the name of the package. And what this does is when you install a package, there's a directory that it that gets installed into that package. So wherever that package is like saved on your system, this command will find it. Um, if you have parsnip installed, you can run this system.file models.tsv package equals parsnip for an example um, on my directory or on my system that loads up uh, my user directory slash app data slash local slash r slash win library slash 4.2 slash parsnip slash models.tsv. So the system.file figured out all that stuff at the front of it. Um, the main way that this gets used, um, sometimes in examples, they'll tell you to call this to load some example file that um, like I think Radar has uh, examples of this. Um, and then even more often, if you're writing a package and you have files that you need to manipulate, um, that would be how you access them. I think that's all I had for three. Yeah. So do you have any comments, questions, concerns for this? All right. We'll go on to four. Um, again, chapter four in the book, there's like nothing. It just says, you know, use, look at these slides. And I went with her latest version that Jenny Bryan did this as a talk for uh, NormConf uh, last month, which was a, a conference of like, um, it was, it started as a joke of there should be a conference where people just talk about the normal things that you do all the time and how to deal with like more baseline things. So Jenny gave her talk about how to name files. Um, and that's the kind of talks that they had in the conference. It was really cool in that way. Um, Cause it was just like infinitely useful. But her talk is great. I do recommend going and watching it. I've got the link in the, the notes. Um, but so our two learning objectives that I pulled out for this are to explain why it's useful to have a file name convention. So like internalize why, why should you have some standard? And then to uh, we're going to describe Jenny's naming convention and why she argues that it's the way you should do things. But her main argument is to understand that uh, you should do things consistently. And so, uh, so why have a convention? Um, it's good to have something that is machine readable, that's easy for to parse into meaning uh, using code. So the example that she gave in the talk actually uses the current dev version of tidyr. So that's why I've got the install GitHub of tidyr there. 
Um, and I have a typo here, but simple file name. Uh, so she shows like a directory that has file names that look like this. And um, we'll talk about exactly what that means in a little bit. But then with this separate wider delim function that's in the new tidy R, uh, you can just take a list of file names and give it a delim deliminator. So this uh, regex and what this is doing, if you're not familiar with regex, it's looking for uh, an underscore or a period. So that's all that's really happening here is if it finds an underscore and a period or underscore or a period, like we have here and here, and here and here, it'll split the file. And so then you can say, okay, that first split, that's gonna be the date. The second one, uh, breath, W-T-N-E-G, S-A, or S-A is gonna be the S-A column. The FFP, E-D-N-A, that's the line column. CRC 141 is the, oh, sorry, sorry. No, all of that is the line. I, I, I broke at the hyphen, but it's, she breaks at the underscore. So that's the line. The AO3 is the well. And then um, finally the CSV, she just drops because she knows it's a CSV. So, so she doesn't want to keep that. In your case, you might want to know the file type um, depending on what you're working with. But the idea is by having this rule that underscore always breaks things, she made something that's easy for uh, easy to work with in code. So it's machine readable. Likewise, it's human readable in that, you know, you can just looking at it, you can see there's a date, there's something that means something here, you know, as you're working with it, that probably makes sense. Uh, you can see the different pieces. So it's nice and human readable. And then the last thing to really, um, that is useful is that you can make things sort in a useful way. So here she starts with the date in a, and we'll talk about why exactly this date format the idea is something that is um, sortable. Now, I guess I didn't really go into the other reason to have a convention is that you don't have to like look around for the file. Like if you have a way that you name things, you'll know where to look for it. So that's a piece that I don't have in the bullets, but that's you know, part of why to have a convention. And it just makes it easier to know what you're looking for or what you're working with as you load files. And in her specific convention, so looking at that file again, she uses an underscore to delimit fields. So the date versus the assay versus the line uh, versus the well. Um, and then she uses a hyphen to delimit words within the fields or, or pieces within the fields. So the 2014-02-26 has hyphens. The um, FFP EDNA CRC 141 has hyphens. And I have always like kind of resisted this, but her point is that people use hyphens in, in dates. So therefore use hyphens as your break because dates should all be what, thought of as one piece of it. Um, and, and you're gonna get those hyphens and therefore go with that. Um, so the spaces or the, sorry, the underscores are the breaks in between pieces, hyphens are breaks inside of pieces. And just um, part of that is just have a convention um, but I'm trying to adopt hers because she's not wrong. Dates have hyphens in them. Let's keep that as a, a rule. Um, and then, so the other like rule that she has basically is to make things easy for future you. And part of what that means is don't like over abbreviate. Um, you know, like there's probably an even shorter way of saying this, but it wouldn't have all the info you need to understand what you're looking at. A harder example of that is when I was going through, I went through and renamed all the files, or at least um, the the first four ch chapters in our notes in the book. I um, by default I always set them up as just the chapter number, but I added the chapter titles, and um, I was tempted to kind of like just use a keyword like file names or something. I was like, no, I'll use the actual full title of the chapter so that I know what you know. If I know the name of the chapter, I can find the file that goes with it easily. Um, so that's that. And then, um, often, uh, and this is a guideline, not a rule, but start with something numberish, uh, so that when you're sorting, it makes sense. Now the extension, she says, um, I think the way she put it was like, there should be something numberish at or near the beginning of the file name, because sometimes it'll be like, you have headers, you know, headers is the first word. And then you have numbers after that. But if you have 
you know, put numbers up front, front-ish somewhere so that uh, sorting is easy. Um, if you have numbers, you should left pad them with zeros. So for example, if you're looking at chapters, don't name the first one one dot rmd, name it zero one dot rmd. Uh, something that's useful for this is string r has the uh, string pad function which you can say, okay, I want all of my numbers to have width two and I want to pad with a zero. And what that'll do is it'll put a zero in front of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, but it won't add a zero to 10 because 10 is already two characters wide. Um, I use this when I'm setting up the chapter or the books uh, initially to generate all the file names. And then um, the, the last piece that we've seen quite a bit already is to use the ISO 8601 format for dates, which is year, 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 month, month, day, day. That way they sort uh, in order. They don't jump when you go from one year to the next, things like that, that it's the actual order of the um, in which things occurred. And so that's what we have here of 2014-0226. And in a record, you know, total of 19 minutes, including waiting, that's it. That's these two chapters. Um, there's not a lot to it, but it's just useful to do it. Um, it's It takes some practice, I think, to kind of, uh, well, and part of the practice is to not have to rename things because, you know, you can do this without having any practice and you'll just have to keep renaming things. But once you get in the habit of it, you don't have to keep moving things around and realize, oh, I wish I had done this this way or move these things over here. Um, but the, and then it just becomes easy to work with the, the being able to do this kind of thing with a file name is super useful because that way you can hold information about the file, like in the file name. Um, and yeah, I think that's like, that's all the things. <laughs> you have anything else to, to add, Federica? Uh, no, that's all pretty new to me. I don't use that very, very, very often. So the, this stringer, uh, string pad, uh, it looks in interesting. So the last, the last function that you just showed uh, for, for naming the chapters. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the string pad. Oops. Manage with files and create auto um, So a certain number of files without naming each one by themselves, you know? Yeah, yeah, there yeah. are there are several ways to do that, um, the padding in uh, R. And if you search for like left pad number in R in Google, it, it comes up with a um, Stack Overflow post that has a bunch of different answers. The string pad is the cleanest to me. It, it's the easiest code to read. Um, there are some base R functions that will let you do it, but they're um, harder to, like they, they take more understanding of a formatting language, whereas this, you know, you just have to use the arguments of the function. So I like it a lot. And I'll, obviously, like by default, the pad is just a space. And so you can use that just for like, if you want um, strings to be a certain width. So if you want to pad out names to have a certain width and you can pad on the left or on the right, by default, it pads on the left, but you can make it pad on the right. So lots of different uses for that, uh, or including within file names. Like maybe you want to put underscores or, or hyphens to make something a certain width, because sometimes it is nice for the file names to, you know, to make a grid just in your file system. And so maybe, this can be anywhere from, what is this? 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So maybe, um, you know, these could be anywhere from eight to 14 characters and you could say string pad, uh, all of those things, width 14, pad, hyphen, and direction or, or side. I can't remember what the argument is, uh, right. And just put hyphens on the right side of it, whatever. Um, technically, you can do spaces. I don't think she talks about it in here. It's less of a problem now, uh, but spaces can cause problems between different operating systems. So usually don't use spaces and file names. Um, but yeah, you could pad with whatever uh, character makes sense for whatever your purpose is. Um, 
yeah. <laughs> so, so next time, next week, um, uh, uh, who was it that signed up? Um, do, 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 do. Um, Mohammed uh, Rifat has agreed that he'll take the next uh, two weeks actually for this club. And so that's good because uh, I am in several book clubs right now and <laughs> it's good to have other people taking weeks. So um, we'll talk about chapter five and we'll see what he comes up with because chapter five is another chapter that has no actual content in it other than notes on what should go there. Um, yeah. All right. <laughs> I think that's okay. it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.